I was working for 900 AM WNYN in Canton, Ohio. And uh, yeah, somehow I got the, the news that uh, they were going to come and do press at the Quaker Square Hilton Hotel, which doesn't no longer exist. Uh, but that's at the ballroom there. They were going to do press. And I don't know why for an AM radio in Canton, I was news director and I decided this is this is newsworthy enough for our audience. So I went up, to, you know, and covered it there and recorded it. The whole ballroom was filled. I've never seen so many reporters uh, for any local thing like this. There had to be 200. And uh, and Simon and Garfunkel stood up at a podium, I remember. And uh, for a while, they, they stood there at first just so everybody could take photos of them. Uh, Simon ended up saying something like, yeah, um, we'll give you like another minute so we can smile and then we'll go back to our... In effect, we'll go back to our usual antipathy. And at first, I wasn't sure if he meant for reporters or for each other, you know, because, of course, they had been broken up and angry at each other. So that was that was a big issue. They seemed OK with each other, not like they were they weren't joking around as as like close buddies or anything. But I but I think that was, you know, partly because they were uh, standing up in front of reporters and some of whom were asking personal questions. It came up a lot, in, including, I think, uh, I, when I li listen back to the tape, I, I'm pretty sure it was Jane Scott who was ask, asking about their separation. And Art Garfunkel just said, you know, it just got to be where it wasn't there was no fun in it anymore. Um, without going into a lot of details. But they started to get a little bit annoyed with those those kind of questions and really annoyed when people started asking him about who they were dating uh, because Simon was, uh, I believe, had just gotten actually married. I'm not sure if it was official, but I believe he got married to Carrie Fisher. And uh, and supposedly Art Garfunkel was dating Penny Marshall. <laughs> and people wanted to know. And they were like, really, you know, leave that out of it. Although, uh, you know, when asked about their new album, uh, Simon did say, well, I, I always write about my personal life. And, and I still am. They were asked why they're coming together. And, and Simon said it was, uh, we're back by popular demand. And, he, and he, what he meant was that, that um, uh, concert in the park uh, the, he says their, their reaction was just so tremendous that they ended up actually going on the road before Akron. They went to Europe and Australia. I think they were trying to get the kinks out <laughs> before they came to America. And, they, and, and then they end up picking Akron, Ohio, of all places. Akron used to be a big record market. Remember that? DJs used to break records oh, yes, for their sales. Right. Yeah, that's right. Does it still happen there? I don't really know. You know what? <laughs> They go out on the limb for a record they like, and they don't wait for, th for secondary and tertiary markets to establish the popularity. Mm -hmm. If they like it, they'll play it. And they get right behind it and push it. And, uh... It used to be that way. Yeah. So, it was uh... disproportionately effective toward getting a record off the ground. Disproportionately? Well, for the size of, of the market. Somebody asked uh, Simon and Garfield, do you guys ever think back in the 60s that you would be doing this, that you'd come back in the 80s? And, and they said, like, you know, no way. But they said, well, it's better that we're doing it. And then somebody asked, gee, do you think you could come back and do this in your 50s and 60s? You know, <laughs> And Simon says, well, no, because I have to get back to my athletic career. <laughs> so, and, and yet he's still out there doing it, right? It was interesting to hear him talk about lyrics because his were so amazing that uh, uh, for a lot of us of a certain age were actually taught those lyrics in school. Uh, they would bring it up in sort of like a literature class uh, as a way to connect with young kids and the music that they were listening to, the kind of poetry of of Paul Simon. And he said, yeah, there was a time in the 60s, a brief window where lyrics were really important. And he says, and then it all just went to hell and it turned into dance music. Um, but he did point out, he says, you know, like disco, which came in the late 70s and how horrible it was. But he did point out, but you know what was nice was new wave music brought back interesting lyrics, except that they, they framed it within kind of electric dance music. You know, you think of like the B-52s or Devo or something like that. Crazy, interesting lyrics. But yeah, it was still kind of dance music. They felt at that time that, you know, New Wave people still felt like they had to do it. I'll tell you one thing, though. Being the 80s again, uh, I do remember that he and I think Garfunkel both wore these uh, like sport coats uh, over, say, T-shirts 
with the sleeves rolled up, which is the dorkiest thing ever, but it was clearly right out of Miami Vice. He happened to also talk about the fact that he loves, you know, just growing up, the idea of like a summertime concert outdoors. You know, he says, what's he said? He called that magical. And I really think that their concert was kind of magical when it was beautiful out like that under a full moon, that kind of thing. It's just so great. After the press conference, they said uh, somebody from the University of Akron says, if you would like to go down to the Rubber Bowl while Simon and Garfield Funk will do their sound check, we have buses outside. So we all hopped on their bus and uh, all these reporters went down to the Rubber Bowl and uh, uh, so Simon and Garfunkel sang about four or five songs. They started off with Cecilia, which was fun because I remember that from high school, that, that song. They did Mrs. Robinson. These are all from the bookends album. Uh, America, they did. Their, vo their voices were terrible. They were so flat. And I, I think, you know, it's, uh, to give them a break on that, I, I think what was going on is they were um, basically kind of going through some of the the electronics and the band and the uh, get to get just the sound right. I don't, they, they were not putting any effort into making their harmonies perfect. And he brought up something that always stuck in my head ever since then, um, where he said, you know, back when we were just Simon and Garfunkel and we were at the peak of our careers and stuff, we were leaving a show at the Hollywood Bowl and they're like getting in a car to go or something. And, and some girl is like running after them saying, we love you, don't ever change. <laughs> and, and he thought, and even in Akron, he just stopped and went, Wow, don't ever change. What a what a concept, you know. Don't ever learn anything more or do anything. And you know, Paul Simon's kind of his whole career is about going through changes.